Welcome to Relation Tales. Please like this video and subscribe Relation Tales. When my wife asked me if she could be with someone else just once, I got really angry. I was surprised and didn't know how to react. How could she say something like that after being together for 21 years? All I knew was that I had to make a big decision right away. Maybe I should have seen it coming. Everything seemed perfect, especially at that moment. It was a Friday evening in the middle of summer. I was enjoying a cold drink and watching a baseball game between the Cubs and the Cardinals. My dog Rice was next to me, half asleep, only waking up a little when I cheered for the Cubs. Except for the TV and my occasional loud reactions, the house was calm. My wife Tracy, who I've been married to for 21 years, was at a neighbor's house. My 18-year-old son and 17-year-old daughter were both staying with friends for the night. So it was just me, the dog, the Cubs game on TV, and some Corona beer in the fridge, along with a few limes I grabbed earlier. I usually didn't bother with the limes, but I decided to treat myself tonight since I had the evening to myself. I heard the front door open and close, thinking it was Tracy coming back from visiting her friend Lisa. Even though I heard someone moving around in the front of the house, they didn't greet me like usual, which seemed strange. But then I got distracted when the Cubs manager, David Ross, made a controversial decision, and I got really mad, startling the dog again. It took at least five minutes before Tracy finally came into the family room. She seemed contemplative, perhaps anxious. Instead of coming over for our customary kiss, she sat on the edge of the sofa beside my chair. While keeping one eye on her, I continued to follow the game with the other. Can we talk for a minute, Bob? She asked, her voice barely audible over the television. Her words grabbed my full attention. Of course, Blondie, I replied. I observed a faint layer of perspiration on her forehead and noticed her breathing was irregular. I pondered whether someone we knew was unwell or had passed away. Could you turn off the TV, Bob? She requested, her fists clenching and unclenching, turning off the TV during a Cubs game. She understood the significance of her request. It had to be something serious, not just illness, but death. A sense of unease settled in my stomach. I reached for the remote and silenced the television. What's wrong, honey? You don't seem well. Has someone passed away? I inquired. Oh, God, no. Nobody has died. She responded quickly. It's just that this is incredibly important to me and I need to ensure you're fully attentive. I nodded silently, my mind swamped with troubling thoughts. We locked eyes for what felt like an eternity. Fear was evident in her gaze along with something else, perhaps anger. You know I love you completely, and I would never betray you, never be unfaithful with another man, right? This wasn't the question I had anticipated. Suddenly, the dinner I had earlier in the evening and the two beers I drank during the game seemed to be threatening to resurface, right there on the family room floor. I nodded quietly again. I'm 45, Bob, she started. Except for you, I've only been with one other man in my whole life. People still find me attractive. My friends even call me a hot milf. I want to be with another man just once, to feel the excitement of someone new, someone different, before we get old together. I was stunned. I didn't move for what felt like a long time. It was like a fast train rushing past my ears. No, no, absolutely not, I shouted, jumping out of my chair. That won't happen as long as I'm alive. She looked at me with wide eyes as I walked back and forth. It felt like a terrible dream. Maybe I fell asleep in my chair and went into a nightmare. This isn't about you and me, Bob. It's about me, my own needs, going beyond you and our family, she said firmly, her voice getting stronger with each word. I believe I've been a devoted wife and mother all these years. I've always prioritized the family, but now just this once I need to do something for myself. I need to feel like a confident, desirable woman in control of her life. Do you not feel desirable with me? I inquired, realizing I sounded pathetic. I express my love for you constantly. I believe I consistently make you feel desired. I still crave you and I don't think I'm subtle about it. You do, and I appreciate that, but this is about something else. I still crave validation for my ego. From men other than you, Bob, it's gratifying to be noticed by other men. It's exhilarating to imagine that another man desires me in that way. Doesn't it make you feel good when you catch a woman looking at you or flirting with you? I'm not unlike anyone else. I enjoy being looked at, desired, and after all this time I desire no more than that. I yearn for the experience of going out on a date, being treated to dinner and wine, then pursued and desired by a different man, just for one night. Not love, just desire, one night. Then I would return home to you and be yours. Be a devoted wife and mother for the rest of my days. You're far from just a devoted wife and mother to me, Blondie. I countered. You're my everything. I can't bear the thought of you being with another man. I refuse to let you go to another man. You keep saying you love me. 
Why not demonstrate your love by granting me this? I know it's a lot to ask. Perhaps the biggest ask. And it would mean everything to me if you were to allow it, she insisted. No, it would be really silly for me to say yes to that. If you really cared about me, you wouldn't have even asked, I said. Haven't I been a good husband to you and a good dad to our kids? Shouldn't that count for something? But you had more partners than me before we got married. I just want things to be fair, she argued. Well, we never really talked about how many people we'd been with before we got married. All we talked about was promising to be faithful after we got married. And just so, you know, I've only been close with four women in my life, including you. So it's not like I've been with a lot of people, I explained. Oh, I always thought so. You had much more experience than me, she admitted. You seem to know so much more than I do. I've done a lot of reading on the subject. I want to make you happy in every way I can. So you're still firmly against it then? She inquired. Not only am I firmly against it, but I'll be contacting a lawyer first thing Monday morning to begin divorce proceedings. I declared, noting the shock on her face. But, but, she stuttered. I understand this must have been difficult for you to ask for, which tells me you're serious about it. That also tells me you won't give up easily, I said. It means you might eventually try to do it behind my back. I no longer trust you not to, unless you've already done so. And this is just a way to seek permission after the fact. No, I swear I haven't been with anyone else. I promised I wouldn't cheat on you, and I meant it, she pleaded. But now that I know you want to, you might see it as not cheating since you've asked, I stated, locking eyes with her. Her avoidance of eye contact conveyed all the information I needed. Are you really willing to tear apart our family, even though I haven't done anything yet? She questioned, her voice hoarse. If you've mustered the courage to ask, it suggests you've been contemplating this for a while. And that indicates you already have someone in mind. Perhaps he's been involved in the planning too. Lunches, dinners. Emotionally, you've already betrayed me. By the way, who is he? I inquired. I didn't have anyone specific in mind, she replied, her gaze fixed on a spot on the wall behind me. The silence stretched for about 15 seconds as I bore into her with my stare. She flushed crimson when she met my eyes, registering my disbelief. You don't need to know, Bob, she murmured. Well, technically, no, I don't. But I'm curious about the man who's causing trouble in what I thought was a strong marriage. You can tell me, or I can talk to all your close friends, your boss, and everyone you work with, I warned. Her mouth fell open in surprise. You wouldn't, she started. Wouldn't I? What do I have left to lose? My life's already a mess, my marriage is ruined. A little embarrassment doesn't matter much to me. What about my embarrassment, she cried. I just shrugged and tried to hide my smile. What's your name, I asked firmly. Dan, Dan Wilson, she replied softly. Please, Bob, don't hurt him. I can't promise anything, I said. I grabbed the remote and went back to watching the game. She sighed, holding back tears, got up from the couch, and went upstairs to our bedroom. I sat glued to the Cubs game, but my mind was elsewhere. I couldn't recall what aired on TV afterward, but I remained in front of the screen for at least another two hours. Despite my efforts to conceal my emotions from my wife, the truth was I felt utterly devastated. I had no inkling that she was contemplating being unfaithful. Looking back, I realized I should have noticed signs of her discontent with me or our life together. Over the past three months, Tracy had grown increasingly distant, not only from me, but also from our children. In fact, it was our daughter Sherry who first observed it, asking if Tracy and I had been in some sort of disagreement. The closeness between us seemed to have diminished, I observed. Our frequency of sexual intimacy, which used to be two or three times a week, had decreased to once every other week despite my efforts. I began to wonder if she might be experiencing some early changes. Furthermore, there were instances of her taking phone calls outside of the room, which was a new behavior, along with nearly constant late-night texting. When I asked about it, she attributed it to Lisa, who supposedly was dealing with issues in her marriage with Jerry. This intrigued me because Jerry and Lisa lived just three doors down from us, and I had no idea they were encountering any problems. Over the weekend, I dedicated considerable thought to my available choices. I informed Tracy of my intention to initiate divorce proceedings promptly, but before doing so, I needed to thoroughly evaluate every aspect of my marriage and family. It wasn't difficult to comprehend why other men might be attracted to Tracy. I first met her when we were both 21, and even at 45 she had only gained 10 pounds despite having two children. Complimented by ample breasts and a firm buttocks, along with her youthful appearance, made her seem closer to 35. I often pondered how I ended up with Tracy, considering she was clearly out of my league. 
Although I'm not unattractive, standing at 5'11 and weighing 175 pounds, men like me don't typically end up with someone who was the prom queen just three years prior in high school. Our paths crossed in an astronomy class at Purdue University during our junior year. While I was taking it for enjoyment, Tracy needed it to fulfill her science requirement. Being somewhat of a geek, I was more than willing to assist her in passing the class, knowing that science wasn't her forte. As the first semester drew to a close, we found ourselves studying in my dorm room when Tracy suddenly leaned in and kissed me passionately. I reciprocated the kiss with equal intensity. Damn, for most of the semester I thought you were gay, Tracy remarked after we broke the kiss. No matter what I did, you never seemed interested. I was definitely interested, but I had no clue it was mutual. I was just trying my best not to drool over you, I replied. We immediately entered into an exclusive relationship. I didn't have much experience in bed, but it seemed really important to her. She never complained and seemed to like everything we did, probably because I read a lot about it. While my friends were into adult movies, I studied what they did in them. Tracy found it helpful right from the start. During our second time together, I was able to make her pass out with something I said. When she woke up two minutes later, all she could say was, I love you, Bob. Two years after we finished school, we got married. Three years later, our son was born, and then our daughter. We were doing well financially. I worked in it, and she was a banker after she went back to work when our youngest started school. Our son was getting ready to start college at Ohio State in a couple of months, and our daughter was almost a senior in high school. In just two years, we would be empty nesters. We've been talking about our future plans, including travel, for the past few months. I had been in love with this woman for nearly 23 years. On one hand, ending it all because she requested permission to cheat seemed overly severe. But on the other hand, her reaching the point of asking was a significant issue. I wasn't naive. I understood that if she was desperate enough to seek permission to cheat, she might resort to doing so behind my back, especially since she disclosed it to me and didn't perceive it as cheating, though I did. Moreover, there was the issue of her already engaging in an emotional affair with Dan Wilson and planning this act of physical infidelity together. Could I ever forgive that? I immediately contacted a divorce attorney on Monday morning and scheduled an appointment for that Thursday afternoon. Meanwhile, Tracy attempted to convince me against filing for divorce. We haven't done anything, Bob. We won't, Tracy pleaded. Is it because you genuinely don't want a divorce or because you know it's wrong? I inquired. She avoided eye contact and remained silent. You're still hoping I'll change my mind and allow it, aren't you? Her hopeful expression sadly confirmed our inevitable fates. I had Tracy served with divorce papers a week after meeting with my attorney. We resided in a no-fault state and had similar incomes, simplifying the financial aspects. With the children nearly grown, arrangements would be made gradually, with a non-custodial parent responsible for child support for a year. The plan was to sell the house and divide the proceeds, wrapping up our 21-year marriage. However, things didn't proceed as smoothly as anticipated. Tracy retained a skilled attorney who persuaded the judge to mandate four counseling sessions with the possibility of more if deemed necessary. The counselor, a woman in her mid-30s, shared the viewpoint of my children and Tracy. If my wife hadn't committed adultery, why was divorce deemed necessary by me? I relayed to the counselor the same sentiment I shared with Tracy and my children that I viewed her proposition for extramarital relations as a breach of our marital vows. As a result, I no longer felt I could trust her as my spouse. Though I may still harbor some love for her, I couldn't remain married to someone I couldn't trust. But I won't ever entertain such an idea again, Bob. I only need you, please, she implored repeatedly throughout the majority of two counseling sessions. You're set in your decision, aren't you, Mr. Rasmussen? Your conviction is clear in your ease, remarked the counselor toward the conclusion of the second session. I will cc prolonging this charity and advise the judge to proceed with the divorce unimpeded. While my personal opinion holds no weight, I'll offer it nonetheless. I believe you're making a grave error here. Your wife hasn't engaged in infidelity, at least not physically. So it appears that marriage counseling would be welcome to salvage your long-standing relationship. Your wife seems ready to do whatever it takes to keep our marriage and family together. I felt uncomfortable hearing this. I really care about Tracy. I didn't decide to end our marriage easily. Dr. Baker, we see things differently. You called it a compromise, but I don't see Tracy's promise to be faithful as one. It's about keeping the promises we made 21 years ago, promises she planned to break with another man, I explained. When Tracy told her parents about our divorce, they were furious. The day after Tracy told them, my mother-in-law called me and started yelling insults nonstop for 15 minutes straight as soon as I answered the phone. 
My father-in-law, usually the voice of reason, rested the phone from her midst her continued shouting. She never even betrayed you and you're ending it after 21 years. Are you out of your mind, Bob? He bellowed. I recounted the sequence of events to him, and throughout I could discern his stifled reactions. Occasionally he would interject with a subdued really, before I resumed. By the end of our conversation he appeared diminished in spirit. With a final apology he quietly ended the call. The following week I relocated to a nearby two-bedroom apartment. While my daughter chose to remain with my wife until she started college the following year, I thought the extra room might prove useful if either of the kids wanted to stay over. Despite understanding my reasons for divorcing their mother, both children were upset with me. A few days after moving into my new place, I had a cordial phone chat with my neighbor Jerry. I let him know that his wife Lisa seemed to have played a role in my wife's plans with Dan Wilson, and Tracy had mentioned that there were issues between Jerry and Lisa. I assured Jerry that I didn't suspect him of being involved in the breakdown of my marriage, but it seemed like Lisa might have had a hand in it. Given Lisa's closeness to Tracy, I couldn't help but wonder if she was also arranging something with another man. Oh damn, Jerry muttered on the phone. So you're saying I might be in trouble too? Does your lawyer offer group discounts? The rise of social media has its pros and cons. For me, a positive was that I could gather plenty of information about Dan Wilson without needing a private investigator, saving me a lot of money. Wilson, a colleague of Lisa's, had moved to our local office from Cleveland around six months before my marriage fell apart. He had a beautiful fiancé who was still looking for work in our city, so he frequently traveled back to see her on weekends. It seemed he was trying to arrange something with my wife for when he was in town, so he could have a warm welcome in both places. I wondered if Tracy was even aware of Wilson's fiancé. That was all in the past now, except for the call I made to Wilson's fiancé. Soon after, I received word from several sources that Dan's wedding had been called off. His fiancé expressed that he was free to be with his old lady full-time. Did I mention that his fiancée was the daughter of a very wealthy man? Two weeks before my divorce was finalized marked my 22nd anniversary with Tracy. I couldn't deny the pain of what I had lost, but as I sat in front of my Swanson TV dinner, the more convinced I became that I was making the right choice for myself. Remaining married would have meant a lifetime of suspicion and searching for signs of her infidelity. I was certain deep down that she would inevitably find a way to betray me. She couldn't stand losing and would view not getting her way as a defeat that needed correcting. I took a sip of single malt and retired to bed by 10 p.m. Happy anniversary to me. At about 1 o'clock in the morning, my phone rang and I realized that my future ex-wife was calling. At first, I wanted to transfer the call to voicemail but decided to answer because I was already awake. She was moaning and breathing heavily. I could clearly hear sounds of lovemaking. I knew those sounds well enough to know she wasn't pretending. Even though I wanted to hang up, I couldn't move while I listened to Tracy encouraging her partner, probably Wilson. I stayed on the line for another two minutes, enough to hear them finish. I wished I had a phone with buttons so she could hear the phone hang up. At that moment, all my doubts about getting divorced disappeared. Following my lawyer's advice, I had gotten into the habit of recording all my conversations with my wife. As I sat there, feeling nervous, I called my in-laws. When my father-in-law answered, I played the three-minute recording for him before hanging up. I was sure there wouldn't be any more unpleasant exchanges like that in the future. Unlike my wife, I didn't seek solace in the company of others until after the divorce was finalized. It was over a year before I took another woman to bed. Admittedly, my social life suffered. It had been 24 years since my last date, and with no intention of dating again, I hadn't kept up with the scene. That turned out to be a grave mistake as the dating world had evolved rapidly, leaving me behind. I acknowledged that part of my hesitation to date stemmed from fear. I dreaded the possibility of another emotional blow. I had loved Tracy deeply, and her betrayal blindsided me completely, without even a hint of warning. One noticeable change I observed since my last stint in the dating world was the shift in women's attitudes. Back then, it was typically one-sided. The man took the lead, choosing who to pursue, asking them out, planning the date, and footing the bill. Nowadays, it seems like women are taking on more assertive roles in dating, sometimes initiating the pursuit themselves and having opinions on how the date should unfold. They even occasionally contribute financially. At times, I felt like a relic trying to keep up with the pace of modern dating dynamics. Being back in the dating scene revealed to me that Tracy Sudan's selfishness wasn't an anomaly. Along seed this newfound empowerment, Women in today's dating scene appear to be more focused on themselves. Many priorities their own desires, sometimes at the expense of their partners. 
It's a me-first mentality that I've encountered all too frequently, and it's a recent development that I've witnessed firsthand. I will not complain about the physical side of intimacy with a 20-year-old woman. Of course, it was quite intense at first, and I thought I might have strained a couple of muscles. But once I adjusted to the physical demands, the pleasure became incredible. I don't want to discredit Tracy's abilities in bed, but at 45, she couldn't match the energy and flexibility of a young woman. Admittedly, I didn't have the stamina of a young man either, but I made up for it with my tongue and finger skills, which was my forte. However, I was not only interested in younger partners, I've had women between the ages of 25 and 55. I can say that I am open to all ages. However, I usually gravitated towards the women of my age with whom I felt most comfortable. After enduring a challenging week, I concluded a meeting with a new client situated on the distant side of town. Still dressed in my business suit, I decided to make a pit stop at the bar of a posh hotel restaurant. Perched on a tall stool, I ordered a shot of Glenmorangui single malt. I got there around 7 o'clock. About an hour later, a lively group of women from a bachelorette party came in and took over some reserved tables. There were about 15 of them, and they seemed really energetic. I was curious, so I decided to stay a bit longer and watch them while I ordered food at the bar. As expected, the bride-to-be was the center of attention. She was a pretty young woman, around 25, with long light brown hair and expressive brown eyes. I have a soft spot for long hair, so I found myself really interested in her, watching her for a few minutes before looking at the rest of the group. That's when I saw another woman who looked to be around 40. She seemed like she was in charge of the evening, keeping an eye on both the innocent and not-so-innocent younger guests. She looked a bit uncomfortable in her black skirt that was riding up her legs as she sat. She attempted to readjust it several times in the initial moments, albeit unsuccessfully. I couldn't help but smile inwardly. She indeed possessed attractive legs. Moreover, she seemed to possess a prominent bosom, not entirely concealed beneath the snug lavender silk blouse she wore. The blouse boasted a modest V-neck, its neckline descending, revealing her seldom-seen exposed alabaster skin. Her ensemble, perhaps leaning towards a younger demographic than she might typically opt for, suggesting it might have been created by one of the younger women in the group. I silently commended whoever selected and encouraged her to wear it. The women appeared to be thoroughly enjoying themselves, engaged in laughter, libations, and refreshments. As a three-piece ensemble commenced playing, several women rose to dance with one another. This display of women dancing together seemed to embolden other men in the bar who gradually approached the women on the dance floor and those seated at tables except for their chaperone. After waiting for approximately ten minutes without anyone approaching the chaperone, I determined it was safe and approached her. With her dark brown shoulder-length hair and bright green eyes, she reminded me of Jacqueline Besse during her prime. Equally significant was the absence of a wedding ring on her finger. She blushed a lovely shade of pink when I invited her to dance. Initially hesitant, she eventually agreed, despite receiving teasing remarks from nearby younger women as she stood up, adjusted her skirt, and took my hand. The first two dances were lively, and I silently thanked my ex-wife for insisting I learn how to dance. The subsequent dance was slow, and I was pleasantly surprised when she leaned into me. Her hair carried the scent of white shoulders, which amused me as it's not typically favored by younger women. We engaged in conversation as we moved across the dance floor. I learned her name was Kathleen Franks. She was the bride's aunt, and she served as the group's chaperone. After thanking me for the dances, Kathleen began to leave the dance floor following the slow dance. However, I held onto her hand and invited her to join me at the bar. She initially protested, citing the need to watch her girls, but I pointed out that she could still keep an eye on them from our vantage point at the bar. We observed the younger women and engaged in conversation. It came to my attention that she was actually 48 years old and had gone through a divorce after a 15-year marriage. She shared with me that her ex-husband, a wealthy man, had replaced her with a younger wife who was 27 at the time of their marriage three years ago. She also mentioned that her attire was chosen by her niece, the bride. She thought her outfit was a bit too young for her usual style. I told her I thought it looked great on her, and I might have said something nice about her pretty shoes. I've learned over the years that women like it when you compliment their shoes. Do you think I look okay in this outfit? She asked innocently. You look amazing, I said honestly. If I had liked her outfit before, I liked it even more now seeing how happy she looked. We talked for about 15 minutes. She noticed I wasn't wearing a wedding ring and asked about it. She seemed surprised when I mentioned that my ex-wife had never physically cheated on me. I'm quite traditional, I clarified. She betrayed me emotionally and was planning to do so physically. I couldn't trust her anymore. 
You can't claim to love someone while desiring someone else sexually. I understand. She responded, everyone has their own boundaries. A few minutes later, she returned to the bridal party table, but she was still open when I asked her to dance again about 30 minutes later. This time, after we finished, she took my hand and guided me back to the table where the other women were seated, now joined by several other men. The evening turned out to be a success from my perspective, despite the lively behavior of some of the younger women. I was pleasantly surprised when Kathy asked me to be her date at the wedding in two weeks. I was originally planning to attend solo, but I believe I'd have a better time with you. Although we've only just met, you've already acquainted yourself with many of the other guests who will be present, she explained. Plus, it would be a huge favor to me because I really wouldn't want to be there alone, looking terribly pathetic. I certainly wouldn't want you to feel that way. I'd be more than happy to accompany you to the wedding, I replied. Just let me know what color you'll be wearing, and I'll select a suit that complements it. She leaned in and planted a quick kiss on my lips. Ooh la la, teased some voices from the end of the table. I grinned, while Kathy blushed once more. I could definitely get used to that. While not dancing, I sat with Kathy. At one point as we were seated, I found myself keeping a watchful eye on the bachelorette, some of whom were visibly overindulging in alcohol. Given that I am the father of a teenage girl, it was only natural for me to adopt a protective stance. My attention was drawn when I observed a young man guiding one of the girls towards the restroom. Politely excusing myself from the table, I swiftly and discreetly intervened, arriving just in time to intercept the young man before he could usher the girl into the men's restroom. The young man regarded me with contempt, evidently unimpressed by an older gentleman in formal attire. Granted, at 5'11 and 175 pounds, I hardly strike fear into anyone at first glance. Nevertheless, I'd like to believe I'm still in decent physical condition, having endured my fair share of hardships in my youth. Sometimes, you have to be ready for unexpected fights to do the right thing, like protecting a young girl from being hurt by that boy. I'd hoped someone would step in to protect my own daughter if she needed it. Let go of my hand and leave her alone, old man, he growled at me. She can take care of herself if she wants, he said. I let go of his hand, but with my other hand, I grabbed his head tightly and hit it hard against the wall next to the door. It made a loud crack in the wall, which seemed to shock him. Suddenly, he didn't seem so sure of himself, and he let go of the girl. It seemed like he didn't want to fight anymore. The club got quiet as people noticed what was happening. As soon as I started taking Alicia back to the bachelorette party, Katie and the rest of our group came up to us, took the woman by the hands and escorted her back to the table. I found myself face to face with the restaurant manager and other employees, fearing that I might be reprimanded. To my surprise, the manager reached out and thanked me for intervening and helping the young woman. The authorities have been contacted. This individual is being taken into custody. They will likely request your details and your version of events. But I believe you have nothing to worry about. By the way, your drinks for the remainder of the evening are complimentary. Thank you once again, he stated. Wow, that was quite the ordeal, remarked Wanda, the bride-to-be, as I returned to the table. Thank you for being attentive to more than just Aunt Kathy. How did you spot that? Kathy inquired. I'm supposed to be keeping an eye out, but I was completely oblivious. I feel terrible about it. Don't blame yourself. It's easy to lose track of 14 girls in a bar if you're not a professional security guard or a dad. Dads, well, most of us possess what I like to call dad vision. I engaged in conversation and banter with the ladies at the table until they decided to move elsewhere for the rest of their evening. Saying goodnight, I shared a gentle kiss with Kathy, feeling pleased with myself and having her contact information saved in my phone. Find a private space, one of the girls quipped, prompting laughter from the group. As I watched the women leave the restaurant, I lightly licked my lips, tasting Kathy's lipstick. Returning to my original spot at the bar with my drink, the bartender remarked, Looks like things went well for you. Who would have thought? I replied with a laugh. A bachelorette party. Give me one more drink to toast my good fortune before I leave. My newfound companion, Sean the bartender, received a generous dollar twenty tip for the evening. Kathy donned a light blue dress for the wedding, so I opted for my dark blue pinstripe suit. I wore what I thought was the right outfit for the room. We looked good together, and some of her family members liked how we looked. During the wedding, a lot of people came up to me to say thanks for taking care of Alicia. It seemed like the bride had been talking about what I did like I was a hero for the past two weeks. You're heroic and good looking. What a nice mix, said Kathy's sister, Donna Fulham, the mother of the bride, when she came over to introduce herself before the ceremony. She thanked me for helping out the girls a few weeks ago and for being the kind of guy Kathy likes. I also met Kathy's 24-year-old daughter Marissa and her fiancé Ben. 
When we met, Marissa said, well, at least one of my parents isn't trying to date someone from my school. She warned me that her dad probably wouldn't like me if he met me. By the end of the party, I felt sure that Kathy and I had a future together. I introduced her to my children a month later. While my son quickly warmed up to her, my daughter remained somewhat distant. She harbored some resentment towards me for divorcing her mother, despite her mother not having cheated on me. However, my son understood the situation. With his own serious girlfriend, we had a thorough conversation about fidelity and its importance to each of us one night. My wife, Kathy, and I entered retirement a few years back. To mark our 25th anniversary, we embarked on an Alaskan cruise. Using a daily key Alice and Astroglide, we engage in intimacy every morning before starting our day. At our stage in life, it's more about fostering a connection than purely physical intimacy. All three of our children have tied the knot and are thriving, blessing us with a total of six grandchildren. I've only talked to my ex-wife a few times since we got divorced. It's mostly been during our kids' weddings and holidays. She's gotten married and divorced again since then, and she often blames me for her situation. She keeps telling our kids that I never cheated on her during our marriage. Some people just don't understand. Second story, my wife cheated on me with a younger man and continues to talk to him. This is pretty raw still, but I was coming home with my wife, 49, when she got a text message and the car announced, you have a message from George. I, 54, asked her who was George. She wouldn't say and wouldn't let me see the message and admitted she had an affair. She left said we were over and was gone while my whole world exploded on me. She came back and we talked. She said she didn't know if she wanted to stay together, but would give it a try. She also asked me to show her how to block George's number. That same day, she said she left her purse in her car and was gone for a bit, so I went to check and found her texting George. I called her out on it, and she said, I just blocked his text. I didn't day I would never talk to him again. She got mad and drove off. Months ago, she asked me to set up her phone so she could be tracked on Google Maps for safety. I didn't follow her, but she texted me saying that by telling my family and our son, I had embarrassed her. She wanted a divorce, but we agreed to live together because neither of us could afford to move out. Today, she said she's willing to go to counseling, but still wants to talk to George because he's her only friend. I told her I don't care and I'll see if she keeps talking to George. If she does, I'm ending things, but I'm stuck in the apartment with her until August. She's only known the guy for less than 10 days, but they seem to have become close friends, which I think is unacceptable. I can't even express how I feel. I haven't cried in so long, but now I am randomly crying and feeling so much despair, humiliation, and loneliness. I don't trust her or anyone else for that matter. She went to take our son to an appointment, and I obsessed over whether she was talking to George. I thought about killing myself, but the thought of her and George spending my life insurance bothers me to no end. I now am just waiting to talk to the counselor to vent my feelings. I still love my wife and told her I could forgive her, but she needs to talk to me and quit this crap with George. She hasn't given me a straight answer yet. Thanks for joining us on this chapter of Relation Tales. If you were moved by these stories, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Don't miss out on the upcoming emotional roller coaster of relationships. Your support means the world, and we can't wait to share more compelling tales with you. Until next time, remember, every relationship has a story worth telling. See you soon.